You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Hi, I'm Dr. Brenna Hicks, the Kid Counselor. This is the Play Therapy Podcast, where you get a master class in child-centered play therapy and practical support and application for your work with children and their families. In today's episode, we are talking through limit setting round two. So before the Jody Mullen interview, I did part one of a limit setting theory into practice episode. And this is the continuation of that. So part two of two for putting limit setting into practice. And I mentioned this in the earlier episode, but it's worth repeating. I'm seeing more and more and more therapists and clinicians struggling to actually use limit setting effectively in the moment with kids in sessions. And so I noticed that they actually are aware of the skills. They actually do know the ACT model. They are able to talk through the pieces of limit setting. But what is happening is that in the moment, they're stumbling to effectively articulate those three components. They're only using a few, but not all of them, and or they're getting stuck on the choices. They're not really understanding what they should be reflecting as far as the emotion and much more. So we're going to talk through why what I've termed the limit setting pause is necessary. So what I mean by that is often when we start to set a limit, we dive right into the limit sometimes. So sometimes we jump straight to, okay, the ball is not for throwing at my head because the ball just whizzed by our head, right? So we kind of jump directly to the limit. <clears throat> and unfortunately, when we do that, either we are not doing the appropriate order for the three steps. Or sometimes we, even if we use the acknowledgement of feeling and the limit, and then we move to the choices, we are missing what's actually going on because we're making hasty assumptions. We will often assume that a child is doing something for a reason. We will assume that a child is feeling a certain way. We will assume that there's a reason behind the behavior and we jump straight into the limit and we do our three steps and it's not actually what's going on with the child. So when we have that hastiness, we lose the why. So the limit setting pause idea was born out of me coaching some six figure people and some play therapy pro people. You need to give yourself a beat to figure out the why. In other words, as soon as we feel, okay, we need to set a limit and we understand there are three questions and there are three considerations, right? And I'm sure you're rehearsing those in your head, but for continuity's sake, I'll make sure that we're aware of them. So is this limit necessary? Can I consistently enforce this limit? And if I allow this behavior to continue without setting a limit, can I still maintain acceptance of the child? We're going to very quickly, microseconds, process those three considerations. If any of those considerations lead us to needing to set a limit, it's almost always going to be rooted in, I have to be safe, you have to be safe, the toys can't be broken on purpose, and things can't be ruined intentionally in the playroom. So those are the kind of two sets of three that we're going to filter through in a split second. And when we decide, yes, I'm moving forward with a limit, the limit setting pause needs to ensue. So we give ourselves a beat and we determine the why. Because often we'll say, you're really angry because a child is throwing something. Or you're really frustrated at me because they're hitting you with swords. But often they're not angry and they're not frustrated because the behavior is different than the emotion. Or we might give choices that do not map to the original need because we missed the original need. The why matters. So when we're offering the alternatives, we have to make sure that those are mapping to the original desire, which maps to the why. So we need to be careful with our options because if we say, you can choose to hit Bobo or you can choose to hit the stuffed animals, What if their original need wasn't actually to hit anything? It wasn't really rooted in aggression at all. 
it was rooted in power and control. Well, we would offer very different alternatives and choices if we understood that it was a power issue instead of an aggression issue. But if we don't give ourselves that pause, we miss the opportunity to really understand the child's emotion and or need or desire. We miss the opportunity to really understand the why. And then our choices get wonky because we can't track them back to anything that's actually true for the child. So I hope that that kind of helps you understand what the limit setting pause serves to do. It gives you a second because, you know, an extra couple of seconds before you set a limit, you don't have to have in the second, we have to get something out. We can wait a few seconds. And then when we're able to actually set the limit, we've given ourselves a moment to let our brain settle into what's going on. Is the child really angry or are they just behaving angrily? Is the child trying to prove something? That's different than the child wanting power. Is the child using their control in the session to their advantage because they want to have a sense of authority? What choices would actually allow the original need to be met? These are all things that we actually have to give our brain time to process. Because if we just open our mouth and start talking, we might actually get a reflection of feeling and a neutral limit and choices out, but they're very likely not going to be on target. So then I'm sure the next question that you're asking in your heads, or maybe you're yelling them out loud to me, I don't know. (laughs) Okay, great, Brenna, this sounds like a lovely idea, but how am I supposed to practice this? What in the world am I supposed to do to acquire this ability to do this on the fly, even if I give myself a limit setting pause? Well, glad you asked. So first and foremost, you should be taking notes in your session. And there's all kinds of justifications for that, but specifically to the limit setting process, if you are taking notes, by the time you need to set a limit in a session, unless it's the very first thing out of the gate when you close the playroom door, that's unlikely. Almost always, by the time we get to a limit, you will have already identified play themes. You will already have identified what's going on in the session, what the child has been feeling, what they're working on, what needs they're playing out, which allows you to map we've already progressed and we're already kind of on this track. I have a pretty good handle of what's going on in this moment. But you glance at your notes to see what you've already documented by that point instead of trying to figure it out in your brain in the moment. So if you're taking session notes, it allows you to kind of keep track. Related aside, you know how much I love baseball. No no surprise. I hand score games and you know there's all these new fandangled apps that allow you to score games. And so Game Changer is a really popular one. And every time we're at a tournament, you know, someone's doing the Game Changer scoring thing. Like, it's nonsense. No offense to the Game Changer aficionados out there. But there is nothing like having a scoring book in your lap and having a pencil in your hand and actually notating every single thing that happens in the game. And here's why I love it. So I used to do it for my son's Little League games. Every game I scored. And then... Now in his travel ball league, they do game changer. So I don't anymore, even though I could bring my own if I really wanted to. But I often will score at Rays games as well, our major league team in Tampa Bay. And it's not because anyone looks at my scorebook. But when I have scored a game, not only am I more aware of what's going on at any given moment, I remember what has happened better than if I just watched it. And third, I can look down and tell you anything that happened in that game at a glance because I've documented it. So my enlargement here or analogy, if you will, is if you take the time to write some things down and to take notes during session, you're going to be more aware, you're going to remember it more easily, and you can glance down and see what's happened in any given moment that you need to. And there's all kinds of other reasons, but... Those are the ones that apply to limit setting. So I definitely suggest that you should be taking notes in session. If you have no idea what that looks like and you are like, oh my gosh, where would I even start? Consider joining us in the CCPT Collective. 
Those are questions that you can ask. Those are things we can talk about on the live Zoom calls. And I've done all kinds of coaching and training about how you can start taking child-centered notes. But that's something that you should be doing and working on and adding to your skill set. So that's my first suggestion of how you can get better at this. My second one is you need to practice setting limits in your head, which I know kind of makes you sound crazy. But (laughs) when you're in the shower, when you're driving, when you're running, when you're doing any kind of brainless, monotonous type of activity, for me, it's when I'm swimming laps. Uh, I could I could bore you to death with all the things that I've practiced and mastered while swimming laps in a pool. <laughs> I've been a, a swimming athlete in all different types my entire life, honestly, since I was very, very young. I've been a competitive swimmer, a synchronized swimmer, a springboard diver. I wakeboard, I ski, you name the water sport, I've done it. And much of that involves 25 yards at a time, back and forth, staring at tiles on the bottom of the the pool. And there is something so helpful about rehearsing in your head when you're doing a repetitive, monotonous, mindless activity. So whatever that is for you, you know, it can be driving, showering, running, biking, whatever. But if you start thinking about X happens in my playroom what do I do? You can talk yourself through that same scenario with four different whys. Do you hear where I'm going with that? So you say, child starts to dump the sand on the floor out of the sand tray. Okay, so that's something you would need to set a limit on. But the why, you could practice setting four different limits and giving four different choices Because there could be four different reasons why a child would try to dump sand out of the sand tray. There are only so many limits that you're going to have to set in a playroom. Quite honestly, I would argue there is a finite number of limits you're going to have to set. Because they all map back to your safety, the child's safety, and property and toys not getting ruined or broken. There's only so many options. So I know it feels really overwhelming and it feels like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to set limits and I'm never going to be able to give choices. And this just seems like so daunting, but it's not. There are only so many things that you're going to have to set limits on. So think about them in your head. What could happen? Child starts to try to open the window. Do I need to set a limit? What could be the reasons? Go. Reflect the feeling. The setting the neutral limit is easy, right? A is not for B, X is for Y. That's really the kind of thing that stays static. So the window is not for opening. The sand is not for pouring on the floor. I mean, those are the things that don't change, no matter the scenario, right? But your reflection of feeling and your choices are going to be different based on the why. So concoct scenarios in your head and rehearse them. In your head, go through you really want to make it seem like there was a sandstorm. So you want to pour the sand on the floor because then it would look like there was a sandstorm. But the sand is not for dumping on the floor. You can choose to create a sandstorm and keep all the sand in the tray, or you can choose to use the Legos and dump those out and pretend that it's sand for a sandstorm. Which do you choose? And notice that those choices would map to the child wanting to create a sandstorm. But what if the child was in mess making play. They just feel the need to make a mess. That's a very different process. So you're going to talk yourself through that. What if the child is in resistance phase and they just want ultimate power and control and they know that they shouldn't do it. So they're going to try it because they're testing boundaries. What would you reflect and what choices would you give there? I promise you, the more you rehearse this, the more you practice this in your head, the better you will get at it and the easier it will come in the moment. But if you wait until you're in a play session with a child and a limit is warranted, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to master this skill. So not only do you need to use the limit setting pause, give yourself a moment to actually consider what you say before you say it, but you have to have rehearsed and practiced before you get in that setting. That will set you up for the easiest, most effective limit setting when you're actually working with a child in the playroom in real time. 
So I hope that's helpful for you. I hope that encourages you. And there's a lot of you all that are reaching out to me with limit setting questions, a lot of things I'm seeing in the videos I'm reviewing. So I want to make sure that we have a handle on this because limit setting, choice giving and reflecting feelings all swirl together in limit setting. We're using three skills in one. And that makes it a little bit complicated, number one. But number two, there's a lot of nuance to it. The why matters. So if we miss that, everything else kind of falls apart. And that's why the pause is so helpful. That's why practicing is so important. All right. So please go to playtherapynow.com if you would like to get on my newsletter, find out about my coaching groups, find out about the CCPT Collective, all kinds of stuff going on there. And gosh, it's been fun. There's been so much activity in the collective and there's been so much going on in the coaching groups. And we're actually ready to launch the June groups soon. So if you would like to coach with me, if you would like to be in the Play Therapy Professional Certified Program, we have openings for June. So you can sign up for that at playtherapypro.com. But you can also get there from Play Therapy Now. So either one will get you there. Reach me at Brenna at thekidcounselor.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'm grateful for each and every one of you. Love y'all. Talk again soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.